ऑनरेबल स्पीकर पद्म विभूषण डॉक्टर आर चिदम्बरम रेस्पेक्टेड प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर अमित कुमार श्रीवास्तव डायरेक्टर फैकल्टी डेवलपमेंट सेल ए आई सी टी ई बिलवर्ड वाइस चांसलर डॉक्टर राम बाबा कोडाली डॉक्टर कांचना भास्कर प्रोविसी ऑफ चेन्नई कैंपस रजिस्ट्रार डॉक्टर जय भारती एंड अदर डिग्नेटरीज एंड स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ द टाइज अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू वन एंड ऑल तिरवल्लुवर इन हिस् तिरक द यूनिवर्सल स्क्रिप्चर हेज स्पेंड अ कप्लेट विच ई डीम फिट टू बी कोटेड हियर बिफोर दिस ऑगस्ट गैदरिंग सेलवत्ल सेलव सेविचल अच्छेलव सेलवत्ल एलाम तले इन इंग्लिश इट ट्रांसलेट्स टू वेल्थ gained by the year is wealth of wealth that wealth is the chief of all wealth true to the words of the famous tamil poet we have all gathered here for the aict distinguished chair professor lecture by padma vibhushan dr r chidambaram former principal scientific adviser to the government of india and former chairman atomic energy commission he is going to enlighten us on the topic emerging technologies and technology foresight we are indeed honored and privileged to have dr chidambaram amit amit us and on behalf of vit management faculty staff and students i extend a very warm welcome to you sir i also welcome dr amit srivastava director of faculty development cell aicte and his team and thank the aicte for having given vit this opportunity to host this event and i am delighted to welcome our vice chancellor dr ram babu kodali pro vc of chennai campus dr kanchana baskaran registrar dr jay bharati deans directors faculty members and most importantly all the students of vit and students and teachers from colleges in and around vellore I also welcome the participants who have joined this lecture online. In fact, we have received a overwhelming response for this lecture which is jointly organized by the Directorate of Quality Assurance and the School of Advanced Sciences and around 1300 participants have assembled here to listen to this lecture from our scientist par excellence Dr. Chidambaram and AICT is also telecasting this session through its official YouTube channel. which i hope will benefit the student community across india once again i welcome you all for this wonderful session thank you now now i would like to invite dr arunay nambiraj dean school of advanced sciences to introduce our honorable guest and distinguished chair professor of aict padma vibhushan dr r chidambaram So very good morning to all. I feel extremely honored, and it is my privilege to introduce Padma Vibhushan Awardee, Dr. R. Chidambaram. Professor Dr. Rajagopala Chidambaram became the director of the Baba Atomic Research Center in 1990. He was chairman Atomic Energy Commission from 1993 to 2000. He was the principal scientific advisor to the government of India and the chairman of the scientific advisory committee. to the cabinet from 2001 to 2018 he was also homi baba professor in bark till recently he is presently the chairman honorary school for advanced studies in nuclear science and technology in bark dr chidambaram has made important contributions to many aspects of our nuclear technology he has dsc degree from 30 universities from india and abroad he has more than 200 research publications in refereed journals and all his research work has been in india he was the chairman of the board of governors of the iaea during 1994 to 95 during 1990 to 99 he was a member of the executive committee of the international union of crystallography the last 3 years as its vice president he has been chairman board of governors of iit bombay 1994 to 97 and of iit madras 2008 to 2011 and member space commission 2009 to 2014 dr chidambaram is currently chairman of the board of governors of iit jodhpur and iit delhi professor dr chidambaram is a fellow of all major science academies in india 
and also of the National Academy of Engineering and the World Academy of Sciences, Stratis Italy. He has received many awards and honors. Notable among them are the C. V. Roman Birth Centenary Award of the Indian Science Congress Association in 1995, the Distinguished Material Scientist of the Year Award of the Material Research Society of India, MRSI, in 1996, R.D. Birla Award of the Indian Physics Association in 1996, Homi Baba Lifetime Achievement Award of the Indian Nuclear Society in 2006, the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Indian National Academy of Engineering in 2009, C.V. Raman Medal of the National Indian National Science Academy in 2013, and also Lifetime Achievement Award of AP Academy of Sciences in 2014, Lifetime Achievement Award of the Council of Power Utilities in 2014. Professor Dr. Chidambaram was awarded the Padma Vibhushan, the second highest civilian award in India in 1999. Sir, we are very fortunate to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arunay Nambiraj. Now I request on stage our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ram Babu Kodali, to felicitate our guest speaker, respected Dr. R. Chidambaram. Thank you, sir. May I now request Padma Vibhushan, Dr. R. Chidambaram, for the much-awaited session on emerging technologies and technology foresight. Dr. Ram Babu Kodali, Dr. Kanchana Bhaskaran, I'm not sure if she is there. And uh, Dr. Arunaya Nambiraj, Dr. Renuka Devi, members of the faculty, and my young friends. It's a pleasure to be with you here at Velo VIT. We just had the opportunity of going around your campus, visiting some labs, and to see the excellent work that is going on here. Chaps. I thought I'll uh, talk to you today on emerging technologies and technology foresight. See, new technologies are emerging all the time and one can do technology forecasting to predict which are the technologies which are going to grow as you go into the future. But to technology forecasting, if you add an assessment based on India's needs, India's natural resources, India's skills and capabilities, then it becomes technology foresight. By and large, technology foresight is equal to technology forecasting plus a critical assessment of them in the context of your own, own country. So I'm going to talk about uh, emerging technologies in this uh, context. Can I have we start the projection, please? Yeah. Okay. Wherever. Ah. Go to the next slide. What can I open it if I can open it? See, of course, you are all in Vellore Institute of Technology and UIT is highly ranked. I looked at the NIRF and other rankings and you are ranked very high. And also you have partnerships with many foreign universities and very interestingly, you are one of the few organizations 
to provide options to study two years at VIT and two years at a partner university. Is that correct statement? This is a correct statement. Of course you have an apprentice scheme and so on. And more importantly, you are committed to fundamental research as well as development of innovative technology. Maybe in one of my later slides I'll show that you cannot build a strong technology superstructure without the foundation of basic research. If you are not upgrading your basic knowledge, one day the superstructure will collapse because you can't wait for new knowledge to emerge abroad all the time. And also you provide uh, consultancy services to the DRDO and the state. We look at emerging technologies. These are technologies whose development, practical applications or both are still largely unutilized. If it's already utilized, you won't call it emerging, te emerging technology. And this could be new and disruptive. Just imagine transistors versus vacuum tubes or large scale integration versus transistors and so on. But mostly these technologies are refinements of older technologies to new developments. The Thomas Fulton has given the credit for developing the steamboat. But actually such boats were being used, utilized in mines. Steam engines were being utilized in mines for decades before that. Since he applied it to a more popular area of travel by the sea. So he got famous because of that. Now, everybody's choice. No two people will come out of the list of what you think are the emerging, most important emerging technology. So this is my choice, energy. Energy, without energy you can do nothing. And many years back I have shown that the Human Development Index, Human Development Index, which the United Nations defines, is very strongly dependent on per capita electricity consumption. If you are not able to, don't have energy, there again you can have no development. Health and water security, environmental security, climate change is a threat to all of us. You know, these carbon dioxide emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, and of course we have setting target, zero carbon by 2070 or whatever. You have to work out your own strategy, your institution strategy to cut down the carbon, the greenhouse gas emissions. Need health and water security, cyber security. The more you connect, the more vulnerable you become. Connectivity is convenient, but that's it. Agriculture and food related security, fortunately, those old days of PL 480 waiting for it to come from the US, those days are over now. And it should continue to be so. And not just agriculture and food related, the new technology, GM engine, editing and so on. But more importantly, you have to look at nutrition. The next generation must get not only food, but nutritious food. Climate change mitigation adaptation. Whatever we can do to cut down the climate change. But it is upon us, there is nothing. You know, we are saying stop at 2 degrees or maybe 1.5 degrees. But 1 degree plus, it has already happened. Sea wall, sea level has risen. So many things are happening. And you have to adapt to the changes which climate change has already brought about. Electronic systems, network technology is an ending process. Electronics keeps on growing. And you have to keep pace with uh, whatever is happening, particularly you are an issue of technology. And also network technologies. We now have the National Knowledge Network. 
I'm sure you are using it very, very widely. And and you have to, with that you can get connected to the other international network, is internet too or the US. The moment you have that connectivity, then you can uh, Without it, it's practically impossible today to collaborate both within the country and abroad. Space and defense technology are extremely important. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, technologies needed not only for law, law, small, large industry, but MSMEs. Particularly, I think it is the responsibility of every technology institution in the country to make sure that proximate industries are given the next kind of inputs that you need. It was very difficult to interact. A professor doesn't mind interacting and helping anybody as long as it is proximate. If he has to travel overnight then the whole life gets disrupted. in your immediate neighborhood and uh, including education in a slightly changed context I want to say I used to tell the educational institutions within 10 kilometers around you there should be no illiteracy see you are doing high technology how can there be anybody illiterate within 5 to 10 kilometers from where you are located and this can be done voluntarily. This can be done by faculty wives or faculty spouses also. And not only literacy, but simple things like uh, medical. When do you go for medical attention? Many of them are not uh, knowledgeable enough, uh, knowledgeable enough about that. Rural development, you are a lot of proximate area. And then, of course, export to orient. This is my list, but this is not, uh, you can have your own list. But then, more or less, oh, I'm going back, sorry, I was wondering. What's happening? I'm doing or you are doing or both of us are doing? See India of our dreams, particularly the young people in the audience. You know, United Nations has these 17 sustainable development goals. No poverty, no hunger and all that. Obviously we have to go through all that, but we have to go beyond that. We have to become a knowledge economy. It's the responsibility of all of us who have been very lucky to get the kind of education we have all got or are getting. Knowledge economy is an economy which is capable of generating new knowledge and also capable of absorbing knowledge generated anywhere in the world. We must have both the capability and then develop it further, adapt it uh, further. In fact, I have been saying, what is indigenization? Indigenization is a catch-up game. Those chaps are developed, we catch up to reach their level. I think that stage for India is over. What I call the catching up game state. You have to go beyond them. There are many areas, India is perfectly capable of being on top of the world. Which are those areas? Of course you have to make a selection depending on your competence. Not only your existing competence, but your potential competence. Are all of us developing our competence to the maximum? I'm not sure, including for myself. There is a latent competence. And this is what the job of the teachers. Teachers have a responsibility of identifying the latent competence of their students. Of course, if you are a very young age, I also am very interested in uh, gifted children. Giftedness becomes apparent between the age of three and five. 
and among them there are those who are profoundly gifted and it is a job of the teacher the teacher parents of course apart from the parents to identify this giftedness and develop it to the maximum extent we want to be a scientifically advanced country we must have an excellent rdi ecosystem i was very happy to see very good labs that you have because i didn't have a time for a full visit but the few labs that i visited and india as a country must have excellence in basic research wrote a paper in 2007 what i called it directed basic research directed basic research is not applied research still basic research but keeping in view the needs of the industry and society in the long term applied research is something which is immediately applicable if you are able to develop knowledge which is important for the country in the long term i call it directed basic uh, basic research go well, then followed by technology development r and d led innovation backed by high quality manufacturing skills if you develop just the knowledge but without transferring the knowledge to industry what's the use of that somebody else thank you very much they says takes away all that knowledge so you have to help it is our job to help the industry to come up with the manufacturing skills that are needed for absorbing this knowledge and convert it into products and processes and we must be militarily strong with ability to fight and win conventional wars we have a very good army armed forces crush low intensity conflicts cannot allow this terrorists and all these kinds of things to flourish and then of course we must have the ability which we have now of providing nuclear deterrence this is an interesting cartoon which actually precedes the 1998 test this guy who is a westerner booted suited stelling the gandhi cap who is obviously an indian you must not make the bomb why do you want the bomb and the gandhi cap tells the boot because if i had one you won't talk to me like this <laughs> it's a very good cartoon which uh, fortunately we have crossed all that stage we have a nuclear quite a powerful nuclear deterrent with uh, national development national security i gave see in 20 years back the naidamma lecture i said national development and national security are two sides of the same coin development without security is vulnerable any time somebody can come around to stop your development and there are examples of that japan at one time they were developing but they had no security because they lost the second world war and then they got they felt threatened by north korea a small country to the north and security without development is of course meaningless and the old soviet union is an example of that they were trying to match the americans spending all their money on developing their weapon capabilities but then they found development was not taking place so they had to go through this process of what they call perestroika and all that to focus on development fortunately india has india you know is a very interesting country that is our target we don't go straight we go here here but the good thing is ultimately we reach the target <laughs> that is the interesting thing about our great country so i talked about a knowledge economy we need a science and technology and innovation ecosystem basic research and all this which i mentioned and we need an advanced technology superstructure you can't build an an excellent technology superstructure without a foundation of basic research and that has to come from universities and academic institutions 
because one day without a good foundation the structure will collapse so this is what i said in a, in a i've been saying for a long time famous i know some of you i'm sure must have read alvin toffler the futurologist he wrote yesterday violence was power today wealth is power and tomorrow knowledge will be power this has already happened now now i paraphrase alvin toffler why was violence power at one time whoever had and continues to be so by the way who had the best technology for inflicting violence was the most powerful india had huge elephants the invaders came with horses and we lost we had swords and they had guns we lost cannot allow this kind of thing to happen again today wealth is power because this was written quite a bit time bit back if you had money you can buy anything today also you can buy anything if you have and tomorrow knowledge will be power that is means it is written as i said some time back knowledge is power whoever has the best knowledge in any field is the most powerful and our educational institutions including you have the responsibility to provide to our young people the latest knowledge and the process for making use of the knowledge for india's development and india's security technology that's why you know the basis of all these three violence wealth knowledge is finally technology and that is why the world over they try to control they try to dominate technology they do it by two methods intellectual property rights patents and technology control regimes so that others if they want to use the knowledge you have to either pay money under this ipr and other their whole idea is deny them technology for security fortunately india has crossed all that we are now is the time to go forward you young guys on the back row you have to take india forward both in term retain our national security at the highest level and then use it for create wealth and prosperity for the country make use of iprs whatever knowledge you can don't give it away remember when writing papers publications unfortunately when you get a promotion they ask give me a list of publications the moment you publish that knowledge is public property so you have to do it very carefully that's what these guys do the western countries if it is something which can create wealth they take a patent first and only they publish of course as i said climate change is upon us one degree it has already gone up the world little more than a degree until recently people are saying don't allow it to go more than 2 degrees now if you look at the international panel of climate change latest reports they said cannot go beyond 1.5 degrees that it is going to be disaster one of the things which very easily understand is the glaciers have already started melting and if the glaciers melt the level of water in the sea and our waterways is going to increase it's going to flood low lying areas fortunately not in india and there are some low lying islands around the world they will be completely completely submerged so it is our responsibility global responsibility to make sure that the urgency is to limit the temperature to 1.5 degrees you know there are three three aspects to climate change one is modeling we don't of course one can talk generally what like i comment i made but 
people want to know what is going to happen to where i am living so you have to do high resolution modeling taking into account the terrain in your place the climatic variation in your area and the typical one they talk about is 10 km by 10 km what will be the weather change climate change in the area i am living high resolution modeling and as i said before mitigation bring it down any climate change and then adapt it because climate change is already here you have to adapt adapt to it see there is a recent october 22 climate there is a report which is by an organization this group of organizations called climate transparency it is an international partnership of organizations their report the latest report is in october that's last month india lost 159 billion this all in us dollars in 2021 5.4% of gdp due to global warming of course i have not made the calculation but surely the country is beginning to lose very heavily and we must do all we can certainly the academics must give the right advice to the government and to people who are otherwise involved coming to nuclear energy you know burning fossil fuel releases carbon dioxide as you all carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas goes and settles up stress prevents the infrared radiation from going away from the earth and that is what causes global warming so fossil fuel burning has to come down what are the maximize of course you already maximize uh, hydro resources building no new hydro power plants is very difficult because you have to take over the land very difficult now with the increased population to shift people people around renewable energy absolutely important solar energy when if is some very good work is going on here solar and wind and other but they are intermittent as i said before you have to do lithium ion battery development with uh, fortunately sikri has done some very good work on lithium ion batteries going to set up a big plant i don't know how many of you are interested in lithium ion batteries i couldn't quite is anybody interested in lithium ion batteries in uh, vit because very close to chennai you know kale dr kale selvi has become dg csir but she has done at karakudi very good work on uh, lithium ion batteries i think uh, good for somebody here to get interested if you are lithium ion batteries anyway if you want to don't want the intermittency of renewable energy you have to go for this and uh, of course in nuclear is an answer nuclear you don't get except from the preliminary stages no greenhouse gas uh, gas emission and you have to close the nuclear fuel cycle you know there are two ways of use, doing nuclear power take the isotopes of uranium there are two isotopes less than 1% is uranium 235 which undergoes fission in a reactor if you use it once and throw away the remaining fuel as nuclear waste that's one way of doing it what we call the open nuclear fuel cycle but while uranium 235 is undergoing fission uranium 238 isotope is producing plutonium 239 absorbs one neutron mass number goes up by one emit two part beta particles which are electrons when they come out atomic number goes up by two so what was uranium 238 becomes plutonium 239 <coughs> just like thorium 232 becomes uranium 233 plutonium 239 is an excellent uh, <coughs> nuclear fuel 
And that is why not very far from here, I'm sure you can go and visit it in Kalpakam, Ajika. They are built, not Kalpakam, in, in Ajika, they are building this fast builder reactor. Fast builder reactor breeds more fuel than it consumes. It's very interesting. Seems to be against the law of thermodynamics. <laughs> but by putting new fuel inside, because every fission produces more than two neutrons. One of them, more than one if you use it, becomes breeder. Now, fortunately, this is what is called the closed nuclear fuel cycle. We don't throw away the, after, from the uranium fission, throw away the fuel material as waste, but you recycle it. We call it the closed nuclear fuel cycle. Closed nuclear fuel cycle. One day I was telling in Hyderabad, I said closed nuclear fuel cycle. That is, fission of 235, 238, because, so Indian Express wrote the next day in Hyderabad, Chidambaram wants to close down the nuclear power program. <laughs> I said closed nuclear fuel cycle. This is to get more. Because the same uranium will give you 50 to 60 times more power. But then if you are willing to close it with thorium, then of course you have access to India. Fortunately, has one of the world's largest reserves of thorium, monazite sign in the peach sands of Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Now there are about 400 nuclear power reactors in operation in the world and 22 in India with a capacity of 6,780 megawatt. Fortunately, one point, we are one of the half a dozen leading countries in the world which has uh, capabilities in this nuclear fuel cycle. See, there is a very good writer called Nassim Nicholas Taleb. I don't know, many of you might have read it if you are interested. The book he wrote called The Black Swan. Has anybody read The Black Swan? It's a wonderful book. <coughs> Black Swan, she so expect the swan to be white. Black Swan is an unusual event with serious, serious consequences. <coughs> He's the man who defined the world anti-fragile. Fragile are things which break down under stress. Robust are things which withstand stress. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anti-fragile are things which get stronger under stress. Like you know, this antibiotic resistant bacteria. And I have always said, nuclear, our nuclear program is anti-fragile. The more they try to control us, the more they try to stop us, we become stronger. And once they knew they can't stop us, they changed the nuclear supplier guidelines, especially for India. Because now they want the huge Indian business that is going to emerge in the the nuclear field in terms of reactors we build, but we also need turbines and generators and so many other other components. So that's why I call anti-fragile. And when I was director Bach long time back, self-reliance is not trying to do everything yourself. If anything is available to you from outside, reliable source, why do you waste your time making it? You use it. But if anything is denied to you, including the proverbial wheel, you must have the capability to do it yourself. That's why I define self-reliance as immunity against technology denial. If you develop this in immunity, they will start supplying to you. They know you can't stop these guys. What's the point? We are losing business. Fortunately, that's what has happened, happened here. And in fact, uh, I used, used to tell my American friends many years back, we need you in the short term. You are going to need us in the long term, which is already beginning to pass. India is not stoppable. You agree? 
India is not. Remember that. Young guys, nobody can stop India from growing. And you know, this man came, Yuki Amano, who was the uh, director general, many years back. What is it? 2012, 10 years back. And he wrote in, um, afterwards, open communication, enthusiasm, motivation, and sense of ownership were all observed at all the levels during OSAC mission. These attributes have cultivated environment of strong safety culture at back. You know, safety and reliability go together. If you maintain your car properly, the brakes don't fail, steering doesn't give you trouble, and you're taking, you'll never have an accident by and large, unless something unexpected happens. Same thing with nuclear reactor. And what he's saying is, if the system is reliable, very likely it is stay. Any complex, any complex system. And in fact, it is so reliable in 2018, the indigenously British pressurized heavy water reactor at Kaiga, Karnataka, broke the world record for continuous operation, 941 days. And this record has not yet been broken, except by another Indian reactor, 941 days. What happened? Let me go back. Next one. Let me. Ah, I. See, of course, we must go for international scientific uh, collaboration in science. We are a big country and people know major facilities. This is for basic research. Large Hadron Collider. You know, you have E equal to MC squared. Mass disappears. Energy is produced. You read it upside down. If energy disappears, mass has to be produced. This is how they do experimental high energy physics. They make two particles to collide. And energy is very high. It's high enough in tera electron volt. Mega electron volt, giga electron volt, tera electron volt. Then new particles are produced. And these are huge machines in Geneva. This is a machine in Geneva, CERN, Center for European Nuclear Research. They are so expensive, no one country can make it now. Seven countries have joined together to make this large hadron collider. Proton is a hadron. In nuclear parlance, proton is called a hadron, heavy particle. And India is one of those seven countries. We have contributed in kind, not in cash. You know, there are 20, 100 meters below the ground, there is a tunnel which is 26 kilometers in circumference. And there is an evacuated tube there. Protons are moving in circles there. One clockwise, one anticlockwise. Parallel orbits. Once in a while they are brought together. When they collide, energy disappears. And they were looking for the Higgs boson, which is 150 times the mass of the proton. And it had to be taken beyond 4 tera electron volt. This they did. And all those uh, corrector magnets are provided by India. A dipole ma charge particle is bent by a dipole magnet but it is focused by octopole, decapole, other kinds of wherever there are uh, corrections to be made. All those were supplied, 1,800 of them uh, by supplied by India. And that is where they found the first signature of the Higgs, uh, of the Higgs boson that you see here, which has been strangely called the God particle. Why this is only the God particle? If you believe in God, of course. Why not electron? Why not proton? But somebody called it and the name has same as stuck. Then of course uh, there is fusion. And this is also, nobody can effort to spend all the money on a fusion reactor. So this international thermonuclear experimental reactor is coming up in Kadarash in France. India is again a member. 
and they have got some interesting results in their early fusion when it comes, which is the fusion of... You see, what happens in fission when the uranium nucleus breaks up? These masses of the resulting particles add up to a little less than the starting particles. And that difference multiplied by C squared, square of the velocity of light, is what you call nuclear energy, nuclear fission energy. Similarly, if the isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium fuse together, there is a mass deficit in the resulting particles. And that, again multiply, that is what, what is fusion energy. One day there is enough deuterium around the world which can be converted also. Of course, you go to higher temperatures, you can have DD fusion also. That will hopefully, hopefully, inevitably rather, one day it may become the only source of energy after we have exhausted all the fossil fuel, after you have exhausted the uranium, what is left? Only fusion. And that is there in seawater, plenty of it is there, only you have to take it out. And this is the cryostat supplied by, by India. See, the entire tokamak has to be kept, some part at liquid nitrogen, some part at liquid helium. And so this cryostat, 30 meters in diameter and 30 meters in height, the largest cryostat built by in, in the world was built and that was our contribution to ETA, which is now beginning to show some result. Built by LNT under the guidance of the Institute of uh, Plasma Research, Gandhinagar, near Ahmedabad. Of course, nuclear is not just nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Nuclear is now everywhere. Look at the nuclear applications. There is no field in which nuclear does not enter. See, if you take Alfonso mangoes, irradiate them, kill all the bacteria inside, you are able to export it. Otherwise, you can't ship mangoes to US. By the time it reaches the court, it would have rotted. It can delay the ripening of uh, mangoes. And unfortunately, if somebody has... Uh, to be scanned, X-rays can't do the job, teletherapy, brachytherapy, all this can be done using the gamma rays from cobalt, uh, cobalt 60, like it, like in the Tata Memorial Hospital in Bombay and many other Adair here. Adair Hospital has the good facility. And then of course other departments are equally well, this is the robust polar geostationary satellite launch vehicle of ISRO. They are leaders in the world. And then they do space inputs for sustainable development out of the various 17 goals. You can do development planning. People routinely now use satellite pictures in order to plan towns or plan... You can see ingress of water if water is is coming in or in places like desertification like in uh, Rajasthan. These are used in a variety of ways. Uh, see, well, let me come to a more general term. What is the step for technology development? Research, development, delivery. Academic institutions are good in research, poor in development. Practically zero in delivery, by and large, there are exceptions. Industry is good in delivery, poor in development, practically zero in research, with rare, rare exceptions. So what I did when I was the PSA, we created these uh, interfaces for what I call pre-competitive applied research. It is some country, some company, sorry, needs applied research it is its business if it wants proprietary it can ask companies academic institutions to do it but you pay for it sponsor a project and then it is fine but if you want to do it generally then it is what we call pre-competitive applied research ipr stays with the 
academic institution which has done the job. And more of this has to be done, taking into account the requirements of proximate industry. Proximate industry. The case of rural development, the problem is not so much of a so much the availability of knowledge, but tuning it delivers the problem. Make it reach the rural rural people. That's why we st started this Rutag Rural Technology Action Group. Started with the seven IITs, including IIT Madras. But of course, anybody can join it. And this is done using technology delivery, knowledge transfer. There is a term called knowledge brokering. I don't know if you heard the word <laughs> knowledge brokering. That is uh, knowledge developed in one context. Actually most innovations are old innovations packaged for a new environment. And that doing that is what is called knowledge, uh, knowledge brokering. Then of course you have to scale the innovation. Then I use this term concept transfer. Suppose you do something which is applicable in Tamil Nadu. I take it to Uttarakhand, smokeless chula for instance. You make rice, they make chapatis. Concept is the same, but it has to be re-innovated to suit their requirements. Same thing for most technologies, local resources, local skills, local requirements may be a slightly different from... Uh, this is the Rural Technology Action Group which I started in and till date so many have been transferred field day one. For example this, isotope hydrology technique with uh, recharge. See what is flowing there in from the hills in Uttarakhand. <clears throat> but very often the water goes away to useless places, not where the villages are located. Very difficult to find this because sometimes the water goes underground. Very difficult to track it. So isotope hydrology is a method you take uh, regular isotopes also, 18 oxygen, 16 oxygen, or you can also add a little bit harmless radioactive tritium, and you can track the water flow and then take suitable action. And this has been done in very successful aquifer research, not only in Uttarakhand but in Himachal and many other places. This, as I said, HESCO, high tech. This is also knowledge brokering. See, I went to Pune. I saw when our army advances on enemy territory, they find they have to cross a ravine. And then they build a bridge, collapsible bridges, which can be even carried by a Jawan. And very often in Uttarakhand, you know, there is a natural ravine. The agricultural land is on one side, they live on the other side. And it is the young women who carry, women who carry the load go through that. And the least that can happen to them is they sprain their ankle. And what happened when I was there, one young woman got washed away because there is a flash flood. That is when I started this uh, project. It's very easy to build this uh, Preachers, they don't have to be collapsible like in the army does. So we brought in the DRDO and built a number of bridges now in Uttarakhand, in Himachal. And I called it a women's bridge, mostly used by uh, women who carry the load in these hilly, hilly areas. Of course, additive manufacturing. It's a slide from Indranil Manna. He gave a talk. He's in bits. Brilla shoot technology. And uh, so many additive manufacturing is coming, it's the 3D printing. So many things can be done selectively which by depositing layer after layer, or you can do even it, deposit the layer on complex parts. Very difficult by machining, machining otherwise. 
and you can see the kind of parts which have been made and then of course uh, i remember when i was there's a long time back when arun shauri was the minister for electronics and i was the psa that was the annual meeting of the department of electronics so he i was supposed to give the keynote address he was supposed to give the inaugural he said let chidambaram talk first i'll talk later so i said look we missed the microelectronics revolution we should not miss the nanoelectronics his chance came he said psa says nanoelectronics uh, revolution we should not miss but he is the psa what is he doing about it so i told him i'll meet you i said give me 100 crores and i'll set up two world class centers of nano electronics and he gave me 100 crores and in shauri set it up in indian institute of science bangalore and iit bombay now there are world class centers many thing and now of course they have spread since so so many places that you see use also is there and it has and this is the nkn which i'm sure you people are using this was also was a proposal that <clears throat> came from our office when i was the pc now almost 2000 institutions are now connected using the national knowledge networks probably the biggest network in the world today and also interconnected to internet too and all that and then uh, this this the meeting i came for actually to cyber security center in sets which is very close to iit madras iit madras this also we had started because cyber security is now <laughs> become sick connectivity is convenient but the greatest security as i said is in isolation so it's not possible now. you have to connect but you have to connect securely and you know there is the story of two young girls playing otaya uh, rattaya we call it no you are no rod two young girls if this girl knows the last time she put uh, even this time she will put odd but if this girl is smarter than this girl she would say she expects even after odd i'll put odd after odd but if this girl is smarter than that girl she know that she would have worked out but if this girl is smarter than this girl there is no unending story this is the same in cyber security who is smarter the attacker or the defender and obviously we want the defender to be the smarter guy so we had actually a meeting also when he came actually for the sets meeting so we are talking on cyber security solutions indigenous see if you get any cyber security solution from outside who knows what trojan is inside something might have been planted there so there are some areas in which the solutions have to come from india of course fortunately a number of good groups the who are uh, carrying out sets carried out directed basic research also convert and uh, this intrusion protection and detection system all these things are there there are also methods based on game theory blockchain artificial intelligence denial of to prevent this denial of service attack simplest thing is you prevent messages from reaching you this is called denial of service attack and other kinds of attacks but of course now uh, many good groups who are working i'm sure that maybe anybody working on cyber security here must be you are there very good then there is internet of things connect devices of course we don't do it yet the americans living alone 10 minutes before you reach home you switch on the microwave oven so that when you reach home the food is hot but if you have an enemy he will switch it on 10 minutes after you left the house 
when you come home, nothing is left for you to eat. And of course, this is the simplest example of internet of things. But operating a reactor, all these sensors, they are all, they are all local. But if you are able to penetrate the internet, you can wreck the, wreck the whole thing. So one is uh, worried about this practice. This is why we call zero trust. Not that you don't, don't trust people, don't trust any connectivity before you double check it. Even individuals, you must double check. Don't only the, the, the identity card. Take biometrics. This is it. See, if any layer of security can be, can be penetrated by one percent, which is not a big number, to make it one in ten thousand will be astronomical. But if you put two layers, each one of them one percent penetrability, then automatically you get your one in ten thousand. It's what is called layered security. Whether it's physical or which is electronic security. And then of course there is nothing we can do about insecure practices. People write your password and leave it on the table for others to look at, then what can I do? So that they don't forget. Otherwise, so safely put it in half a dozen places and visible all over the place. And, and the internet of things when you connect, there are... Of course, simplest device is changing. Don't... See, vendor gives you some equipment, he gives a password if it is a security related. Most people are too lazy to change it. They leave the vendor's password. Then you are in trouble. Then of course firmware updates. When the fellow sends you updated, you verify it. For all you know, he must be a bogus guy sending you an update, but actually wanting to get into your system. Of course data encryption must be very... And two-factor identification, which I mentioned, finally, we should be West. You know, there is a pattern when you have an Internet of Things connectivity. If there is a change in the pattern, the cyber security guy should immediately get alerted that this is not the way normally the network works. Then you must get an alert on that. Artificial intelligence, of course, omnipresent now machine learning, robotics, big data. See, one is we think artificial intelligence, usually think intelligence displayed by systems of a type we normally associate with humans. But AI means much more than that. It follows two approaches. One is, of course, the human by analyzing cognition. Cognitive science is a very strongly developing discipline, cognitive science, and leads to machine learning. The other is creating artificial neural networks to mimic the structure and functioning of the brain, deep learning, artificial neural networks, and so on. Am I exceeding my time? I am. Not quite. Not quite. Anyway. Of course, there are advantages some disadvantage of AI systems. Human errors are avoided, particularly if something repetitive. But, and they have no emotion or ethics, and hopefully they take unbiased uh, decision. But it costs, if you have to update it, AI systems cost money. And big advantage is that AI systems have no creativity. Teach a car to go safely. If you have an accident, you immediately correct yourself. AI system cannot do that. Of course, with great difficulty, to some extent you can do it. And human robots can... The advantage is... Disadvantage, AI systems have no creativity. Advantage is routine, repetitive, hazardous talks where you don't want to put humans, better to put... Uh, Robots. See, you know the famous 
robot Sophia, many of you have. Sophia was a famous robot. And it was being interviewed by a CNN guy. CNN guy asked her, You ask, uh, I, you answer every question that I ask. You look like a human. You speak like a human. So why are you called a robot? And Sophia asked this guy, You tell me what makes you a human. And the fellow couldn't answer. Can you answer anybody? What makes you a human? Of course, you can take consciousness and... Uh, anyway, I won't go into that. And then you see the la last, I'm coming to the end. We should not hesitate to be a first introducer of new technologies. Most people try to play safe. Say, we will grow only for proven technologies so that we are very safe. But proven technologies, in my opinion, are by definition obsolete technologies. The more you prove them, the more obsolete they become. I like this Phil Rosenweig statement in his book. There is a beautiful article by Rosenweig. When it comes to technological breakthroughs or launching new products, it is better to act and fail than fail to act. You will never fail totally. You will, maybe you will go into a new direction. Since you are an institute of technology, I thought I'll show you. It's, of course, it's a matter of uh, risk taking. There is amount of risk and involved in any action that you take. But if you want to be on top, you have to take risks. This is what even the Nobel laureate guy, Abhijit Banerjee. We had a meeting in which he was also there. You must have an appetite for risk taking. And with that thought, I am very happy to close my talk. Thank you. Uh, the floor is now open for discussion. I invite uh, the participants to interact with uh, our honorable speaker. Please feel free to uh, interact with him. Yes, uh, I request uh, our uh, staff members to pass on the mic, please, to the participants. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Like, uh, as a former PSA to the government of India, we are having two long-standing issues. One is pollution in Delhi, and other one is cleaning of Ganges. Right. So, uh, can you be a bit louder, please? Okay. So, uh, my question is like, as a former uh, principal scientific advisor to government of India, you must have come across uh, two issues. Uh, one is pollution in Delhi, okay, and other one is cleaning of Ganges. We have spent millions of rupees on those. Cleaning of the river Ganga, holy river Ganges. Cleaning of the Ganges. Pollution in Delhi. Yes. Pollution in Delhi. So, what is your opinion on those? Uh, Whose job is it? Only the job of the government uh, to clean up pollution. Why do you create pollution in the first place? So, uh, no, no, you tell me. <laughs> See, once you have created the pollution by maybe stubble burning in Punjab, there are other methods of doing it. Even my friend Deepak Pentel has told them, who is a very well-known agricultural scientist, you can convert it into fertilizer. Don't burn the stubble. This is what the farmers should do. But only take a few days for it to get converted. But they can't wait for those four days and they burn the stubble. Once it is burnt and the smoke and the wind is blowing, you can't blame the... What is the second problem you have? The cleaning, cleaning of the river Ganges. Cleaning of the Ganges solution is don't pollute the Ganga. <laughs> Once you have polluted and it spread, it is like saying I put cyanide into my water. 
and tell me clean it up. Why do you put it there? But they are trying, not that there is a Ganges thing. But it is very difficult. See, when you go to the Ganges, go to Triveni, empty the whole basket of flowers into the Ganga. Because that's what uh, some puja you have done on the Banaras. And you go and bathe there with soap and water. I think one of our Shankaracharyas suggested, I think in a, maybe in a private conversation, you should have a bathhouse near this Kaveri or Ganga. Let that fellow have his bath with soap and water there. <laughs> Clean himself. In fact, the better for the Ganges. <laughs> If you go and steal and put all soap, shampoo, I think we must learn not to pollute. And because once the entropy goes off, very difficult to bring it down. It's an entropy problem, high entropy problem. You can make high, high entropy alloys, they are good, eh? but not polluting water and then it becomes very difficult to, government is trying but it's to my mind, it's a very difficult task. One more thing, like, uh, we have been blamed by the Western countries, like, we are very desperate for the development. And uh, when we are going for the development, we are actually, you know, harming our climate and environment a lot, right? So, what is your take on that? What is your take on that? <laughs> <laughs> you see, how I said, there are two things we must do to increase our human development index. One is per capita electricity consumption must increase. And second, we must increase female literacy. I didn't talk about it here. See, female literacy fortunately is improving very strongly. But till some time back, you go to any place in India where the average literacy is low, lower, the difference between male and female literacy is higher. And this is a part of the social culture of that society also. Whereas we go to Kerala, there is hardly any difference, very high literacy. Tamil Nadu has caught up more or less with Kerala now, Maharashtra, southern states. But Eastern UP, Odisha and all that, there are problems. We have to improve. These are the two parameters which per capita electricity consumption increased by six to eight times so that electricity and it's even to provide primary health care you need electricity in rural areas. How can the doctor do anything if he has to take some surgical, simple surgical can be done there but you need power. And the other one is we must try to make, Tamil Nadu is pretty good, but uh, raise it to nearly 100%. Sir, in your talk. Uh, I am Professor Padmanabhan, Director in Charge of Academic Staff College. I think I'm comfortable. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am uh, Professor Padmanabhan Krishnan, uh, Director in Charge of Academic Staff College. Is, is your mic on? Yeah, I think you should. Yes, sir. Uh, now it's on. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, so I have a burning question. Challenges and facing challenges are the buzzwords. But um, when we are getting more and more prominent as a developed nation, as a fifth and the fourth uh, biggest economy, how to firewall our challenges so that some challenges do not backfire and raise the level of internal security and uh, provide for sustainable growth using firewalled challenges rather than facing any challenge that, is, that may not be our priority or national priority. Asking a very complex, a little un understandable question. <laughs> please, please, please repeat it again. Yeah. Sir, can you please? <laughs> In a simpler, in a simple manner, could you put your question, challenge, please? No, challenge I understand, simple word. <laughs> After that, what do we do? Yes, sir. Like, uh, it was too complex, so I will try to make it simpler. Huh, yes. Yes, How, Professor. Yes, sir. How to firewall our challenges and uh, 
not accept challenges that might not pave way for a sustainable growth, raising our security levels at the same time? See, the, no, there is no simple answer to that question. In the sense, if you take a challenge which is based on some problem, you have to solve the problem. Firewalling must, can just mean you ignore the problem. That, of course, certainly we cannot do. If you can kind of uh, take the problem off the map, make it non-important, can it be done? Give me one example of firewalling a challenge. Give me one example. Sir, that is, let's say VAT is now uh, QS ranked uh, 500 or 550 and how to sustainably improve and never fall back using a firewalled challenge initiative. You mean, don't drop in quality? Yes. Because international competition is so heavy that uh, we have to be very careful about getting to QS 200 and within, without falling back. Even IITs have fallen back and then IAC also has fallen back. During my PhD days, IAC used to be world number 18. <clears throat> I mean, so what are your thoughts on that, sir? See, we must try to excel in every area. See, the final result comes from a sum of all the smaller things that we have done. Each one of us, in our own activity, should try to excel in the interest of the country, do whatever best that we can. But others are also trying to do the same thing. The final result is what ends up in these uh, rankings, and all that. Because if others are doing better than us, then we have to ask ourselves, why are they doing better than us? There is no simple question, except we must excel in the interest of ourselves and more than that, in the interest of our country. So there is no general, because the education system is now very good. Look, nobody can say we are not providing uh, Though we are not providing to as many that that uh, we want, we should do that. But an IIT is, has a very high brand equity IIT, and VIT is also nearly there in terms of the brand uh, equity. So we must go on trying. I, I don't think that is a simple. After all, it is us, you and me, and them. That's Indian society. We have to ask ourselves individually what can we do better? What have we done which has not been in the interest of the country in the short term or in the long term and avoid it? Those are the only things I can think of in answer to you. A very deep question, but it's… Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I am Professor Viji, Vijay So, I have a question uh, with reference to the situation of the country and Who is the speaking? future path. I, I okay. can't. Oh, I'm sorry. You are here. Oh, sorry, yes. please. I was looking there and missing the first row. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of biological sciences, biological sciences is including health, food, environment, and good living. Simply good living. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of biological sciences, what should be the guidelines and how VIT can really go uh, uh, beyond and then probably prove as one of the important contributor in the country, uh, so that how, what are the, how we have to organize and what is your advice because we have a very good uh, 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 school and also a few more centers, not one, a few centers involved. So where should we go and how we should probably take it further uh, to be useful to the nation? You are absolutely right. Biological sciences it's very are… very large, yeah. yeah. And you know the National Academy of Sciences, India, NIC at Calcutta, in its Calcutta meeting last December, held a session on the interface between physical sciences and biological sciences. Because, and I spoke on the physical G. Padmanabhan, as you, you know, obviously. I know. You know him very well. He spoke on the biological sciences. 
then both of us said better to put down we wrote an article in current science biology without borders biology without uh, borders because now you see it, biology is growing and uh, biological systems are now being almost considered as treated in studies as physical systems it started with biological crystallography like people like jain ramchandran who did wonderful work in uh, biophysics and so many others starting with the dna double helix crick and watson crick was a physics guy biology watson was a bi- was a biologist so you see the, the whole thing is the physicists can tell you what is the active site of the biological molecule or venki ramakrishnan on this ribosome uh, structure and then you know how do you do drug design you block that active site of the protein of the pathogen which is giving you problem if you can attach some part of a molecule to that then it becomes uh, inactive in 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 that so those are areas which are getting very exciting structure function relationship relationship at the molecular level and then using it for drug design that's a very very hot area hot area at the, at the moment evolution is a very big idea how did uh, evolution take place the way we have so there are many uh, exciting areas which are beginning to increasingly use physical techniques physical techniques but then one has to go deep into each problem and then yes continue please yeah because see i really uh, took it as a advice i mean that's also the way i wanted like very good basic science and with a target i call it targeted research <coughs> long time with my student so to give that uh, the time frame and the teaching how they should what is the i mean is there any special ways and how we can really impart this see there are one, one aspect is understanding the science and the, uh, what is underlying mechanism and then seeing how you can go and uh, put it into practice in a way and third is how quickly we can do because a, r- a rat race is there all over mm-hmm. everywhere and what is the advice to the youngsters today because uh, I, my my time is almost over so what is the advice to the youngsters what we should leave back because for example in my case what i should leave back to my youngsters in saying that okay this is the path that you should take and how we should go mm-hmm. in science and technology in general or in biology in particular no biology particular biology like particular. health science agriculture and environment agriculture in my yeah mm-hmm. see biology and physical sciences have come closer and closer understanding of biological function requires a good knowledge of the molecule till few decades back nobody looked at biology they looked at biology as a, a biological problem but not at the structure function relationship that is one area which is getting uh, stronger and uh, stronger particularly as i mentioned in uh, drug design or even in in stopping the acting of a virus and all those things that has to be done and uh, see the problem is when you are teaching a course one has to make a judgment on what is of general use in their careers that you have we have electives one way to do that in my opinion is to have more electives those who think later on they will looking at biological problems let them have an elective which deals more with biology somebody is going to go into artificial intelligence machine learning and all that let him have an additional elective or all about the general classes they have otherwise the syllabus gets overloaded because so many exciting things are happening in practically practically every field including instrumentation new methods are coming coming up on that on in computer science or automation 
and robotics. So one has to make a bit of a selection. Certainly those who have, who think they will work on an interface of their own subjects and biology, yeah, that's that's they right. should be given a, an elective course on the fundamentals of biology and what or give them an idea that uh, any person in any discipline, of course, chemistry is in you know, biochemistry and all that you already have. But in terms of more physical sciences, of course you have things like computational biology, you know, do analysis using computer, uh, computer data, cognitive science. In fact, that is the reverse. Computer scientists are trying to learn from the biologists how the brain functions and use it in artificial neural networks, which I briefly mentioned. So things are getting uh, very, you know, multi disciplinary and one has to make a choice on how much are you interested and those who are interested must be given an elective of their choice up to a point of course otherwise the person who designs courses will find it impossible to handle it or make it free suppose a course is already there in to a student in some other discipline IITs and VIT do that up to a point, but maybe if some more flexibility, of course it is kind of a case by case, one cannot generalize, because in their own field they have to, they have to specialize also. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I request our faculty members to hold back uh, uh, for a while. Let us give chance to the young minds to ask questions, then we'll get back to all the faculty members. So, over to the students, please. Why not you come forward? Sure, sir. We'll you are a little back, then... Of course, the mic works well and the sound is high, it's okay with me, but... Nothing like looking at your face when you are asking the question. Am I audible to you? Yes. Oh, you are too audible. <laughs> <laughs> ah. yes, so, is this fine? Yes. Is this fine? Yes, it's okay. fine. So, for context, I am a first year uh, B.Tech student and my question is that when if we do any research or any work or any projects, how do we ensure that we are contributing in a responsible way? If I do any research, any project, any other kind of work, how do we ensure that I am contributing in a responsible way? He is a first year student who wants to know when he is doing a research or a project work, how it is going to how do we ensure how that, does he ensure that, that I am contributing positively and contributing in a responsible way? How he is contributing in a responsible manner, positively. Now, you have to ask your guide. <laughs> guide, yeah. <laughs> after asking yourself, after, so you know, like uh, somebody said, if I know what I am doing and what will be the result in research, why am I doing it? That's fair. So, only thing is Peter Madawa. This is a good, which he has written a wonderful book on advice to a young scientist. Always work on important problems. You must convince yourself. Maybe have long chats with your guide. Make sure don't work on trivial problems, easily solvable problems. No, no fun if the problem is easily solvable. Important problem, difficult problem, but something which will, in your opinion, because nobody can be right 100% of the time, at least you must be convinced that you are working on an important problem. That's the only ultimate solution. The remaining are all you can't take anybody's opinion because his background is different. Because his knowledge level is or composition is different. More than the level, knowledge composition is different. Thank you. Okay, uh, sir, uh, for context, I myself am an MSc student, uh, physics, second year. Uh, one problem I noticed when uh, talking about improving the uh, quality of life, uh, even in rural areas, is that uh, Traditions are uh, considered more important than, uh, you know, production. 
what is more important traditions so uh, uh, your uh, the ancient traditions that uh, occur in uh, ru more rural areas if my question would be how can we uh, preserve those traditions while improving the quality of life and the quality of uh, production and technology in rural areas uh, see traditions i have no difficulty but don't confuse superstition with tradition yeah superstition is if right. you have uh, then you have to give it up you cannot find a reason for doing something which they conventionally do except for respect to your parents maybe you do it but by and large do only those things which you are convinced will lead somewhere for yourself and for your country that's all i am able to say at the moment otherwise don't do just because it is somebody is uh, somebody is doing it of course there is a background you can't uh, kind of overlook your culture culture with uh, yeah i have a tradition yeah i was uh, wondering how we could preserve that while improving it uh, improving our standards you have to work out for yourself okay because it depends on your belief also don't against your belief. because i believe in advaita vedanta you believe because I, you know I'm agnostic by yeah. you are an agnostic you feel that's fine that you are one step here and one foot here and one foot there no you know when i went to the us for the first time long 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 time back well before you were born of course <laughs> <laughs> no they said we have only one god son of god jesus christ it was in a high school very bright children in oak ridge natural lab the children of scientists in the lab and she said we have got only one god you have so many hundreds of god 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 all over the place do you think you believe in all of them hmm? what so i know uh, i have not finished the... young man yes sorry sir <laughs> i just wish to ask that question <laughs> no no so i said i draw a figure on the board you tell me what it is i do hydrogen atom proton and they said this is and the children bright said they said this is the hydrogen atom so i asked are you sure this is the hydrogen atom they said yes proton in the center one electron i repeated three times and they said what this comes to work in oak ridge national lab doesn't know the hydrogen atom then i asked them what is the size of the hydrogen atom they knew one angstrom what is the figure i have drawn on the board 3 feet in diameter <laughs> and i have to asked you is this the hydrogen atom you said yes whereas your answer should have been this represents the hydrogen atom so when you have so many gods all of us know there is only one god but they can go beyond to advaita vedanta but all of them we know but then this is the one that uh, i'm comfortable with because of tradition because my mother taught me or this is a family deity but you know in your mind there is only one now you ask your question Uh, okay in regards to the religious issue my belief is there is some sort of supernatural force but it's unidentifiable so to speak see the question you are right it's very difficult to answer this question okay but if you ask yourself the forces between carbon atoms and this platform in my body and in a galaxy a billion year, light years away they are the same can you prove it how can you prove it? yeah that's impossible to prove because that signal is coming from there you have assumed it no but who make sure they are the same if you believe or you don't believe you have to take a position now do you believe the forces between atom and in his body in that table and in a galaxy a billion years away are the same where is the proof see this is where you cannot answer this question 
because of what is called in mathematics the Gödel's incompleteness theorem. All you can do is set up a set of axioms and you can show none of my observations so far are against these axioms. You cannot prove it unless you go outside the system. And you cannot go outside the system. Now you ask me your question. Have I confused you enough? No, uh, you've convinced me enough. You, you've convinced me enough. I actually, in a sense, I do agree with you. Like I said, it's, uh, I do believe there's a supernatural force, but I believe that it's not identifiable. All we can do is act knowing that it exists. No, they are, you are not part of Hinduism doesn't, Nachiketa, do you know about Nachiketa? Nachiketa was an agnostic. Okay. Nachiketa, I'm sure some of you might have. So, you know, this is something you have to decide for yourself. Okay. Are you a believer? Are you a non-believer? Are you an agnostic? And you can be perfectly right. Nobody can argue with you and convert you to a believer. Not enough evidence, but it is a part of And that cannot be any evidence. And even our scriptures, I just, did you hear me say, you read about Nachiketa. He had a lot of trouble with his dad because he was an agnostic. No harm in being an agnostic. Keeping your mind open. Keep your mind open. We'll take two more questions from the students. Uh, hello, sir. Hello. Sir, is it okay with you? No. Two or twenty is okay. okay. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. You're uh, hello, sir. I am second year B.Tech student. I have a question. You are behind the camera, sir. I have a question that is nuclear power safe for human? Because the development of nuclear power was existence of uh, Second World War, and in South Asia too, uh, India and Pakistan developed uh, nuclear power because. Uh, it was being developed in their neighboring countries. So, is it safe for us, nuclear powers? For a biologist to work with infective diseases, is it safe? No, sir. Nuclear is much, much safer than that. Nuclear, much safer. I lived my whole life with nuclear, more or less, after my graduation. So you see, you have to decide, there is no, there is logic, there is a kind of a prejudice, don't fall for prejudice, go for logic. Of course there has been a Fukushima accident, but there was a chemical accident, there have been accidents all over in every area and Fukushima nobody died by the way except one person, because they evacuated unnecessarily. And that fellow lived, went in and his proximate daughter was doctor, was somewhere else. That's the cause of his death. Nothing happened. Yeah, but so, you have to be careful. No question that one can be careless about nuclear safety. Can you be careless in driving? No, sir. In deep trouble? like that. Any high technology system, now ask you. Yeah, but its development was the existence of war to cause the destruction. If you take in Second World War, uh, the, the development of nuclear power was uh, the existence of Second World War. And in South Asia, India to develop uh, nuclear weapons uh, with that reason. So, is it See, safe? This is a weapon. If, if others See, can you afford to have, not have nuclear weapons when your neighbors have them? No, sir. No. Nobody wants to use nuclear weapons. They have seen it in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nuclear weapons are not a weapon of war. They are a weapon of deterrence. But you must have them. Like for your protection, you can have a gun, you can get a license for a gun. 
Not the idea you can go and shoot anybody. You are never in deep trouble. This is a kind of a protection we must have. And India is not, you see there are three kinds of countries. Countries which are not important, nobody is going to bother about them. Countries which are under the wings of the big states, US or Russia and all that. Countries who don't know how to make nuclear weapons. And then countries who are threatened, who can be threatened. And they must have these weapons for nuclear deterrence. Otherwise you feel vulnerable. That these are not, nobody wants to use. They have seen kind of damage it can cause. And the damage is not limited only to those areas. It goes, spreads. So we must have them, but don't use them. Thank you, sir. Please Hello, be a bit louder. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Hi, sorry. <laughs> uh, sir, as a research student, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so, is Indian research is, uh, losing to foreign, uh, like foreign institutes, or some bright minds are leaving to foreign institutes? Uh, according to you, as a like, uh, you are like education is right. So, according to your views on this, and second question is, uh, why does India doesn't have any like uh, standard companies of uh, own enterprise like COVID. Uh, sorry. No, no. What was the first question? So Indian talents are going to other institutes or other universities of the world and not turning back again to the same nation. Brain drain, sir. Students going to foreign unit. No, I agree with the vice chancellor of Madras University a long time back. Who said it's not brain drain, it's brain overflow. <laughs> we have got enough brains to repeat for the sake of it is not brain drain, it's brain overflow. Uh, What's your view on that? Vice Chancellor of your University, huh? X. Yes. No, I have been something. No, it is a personal choice. It's a free country. Yeah. If somebody wants to go abroad, let him go abroad. We have enough talent here who are remaining back. Okay. What so, I advise is go abroad but come back. Well, if you don't come back, thank you very much. We can manage without. You. <laughs> so, in that view, I have a second question for this. Uh, the same view. Uh, so why doesn't like India has is something like central enterprise companies like Rob, like Robert Bosch or uh, like companies like Siemens, which makes high-end uh, science instruments? We don't have that like India. For example, if you see LIG of India, yeah, people are happy for it, and also government is happy for it. But we do not have any company in science, especially like uh, Robert Bosch, where high-end talents are also there. Some diplomats can be given the job, or all the things should be satisfied by the government. There are many companies. Even Electronics Corporation of India, have you heard of that? Yes, they I have, but... Uh, they make a lot of instrumentation. They make all the instrumentation for nuclear reactors. It's all done by so, uh, Electronics Corporation. If you see still number of instru high-end instruments for India, even like scientific ex uh, exercises from Brooker, which is from Germany and all sorts of things. India has a lot and lot of talents. It will take time. You know what happens also. Scientists get addicted. They have seen Brooker there, they have got Jewel there when they went abroad postdoc. And they want the same instrument over here. And okay. to convince them that what we have made indigenously is as good as that. And secondly, to induce industry to take it up. But this is a slow process. Uh, should government take this initiative to develop its own... Uh, no, like there are initiatives of DST. They have got, uh, they have created kind of a science parks where all indigenous instruments are being displayed. As a scientific advisor, like, uh, you can, like, for example, uh, like, can it be a point, like, can you put to the government to start its own enterprise, like, we brought own It's technology. already there, I'm saying. But number of, like, opportunities may be increasing. It need not be government enterprise. It can be. Only thing that the user must convince. Because, you know, basically any instrument we make in India, we can make at half the price of the imported instrument. So, it can be done, it has been done, and in many areas it has been used. But people who go for, particularly for postdocs abroad, they get addicted to some of, they want that over here. 
and nobody can prevent them from importing also. Up to a point. So can government take some initiatives to prevent that? Nobody. You can't uh, go. How can you prevent? Everybody says you can. You are smart enough, guy. Na? You are a smart guy. You are. You hope so. Can always give reasons. He doesn't have this cryogenic attachment. My whole research depends on working at minus two degrees, and Indian can go only up to minus three degrees. So make up some reason, and then you will get the license to import. Importing the instrument has become so easy now. It's but it's up to us. You know, you decide that you will tailor your research. With two available instruments in India. Yes, please. Good morning, sir. Good morning. So, I'm a student of MSc Chemistry, second year. Yeah. So, my question is uh, in our country, like uh, the employment of the majority of the population is uh, basically manpower, manpower because of the lack of knowledge in most of the rural areas. So, when technology is improving and AI and machinery are replacing all of these things, it is posing a threat to the employment. So, how far is it beneficial than posing a threat to this? No, when you pass out, why you can't get employment? Not, I didn't follow properly. No, I'm saying like the uh, people who are not that well educated, so majority of them uh, are employed in as manpower. So, skilled labor, I suppose. Yeah, skilled right? labor. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Unskilled, unskilled labor. Yeah, unskilled labor, I'm sorry. So, when artificial intelligence and machinery is going to be replacing many of the uh, many of these things, then uh, it will pose a threat to the employment issue. So, are you saying automation will automation? Uh, yeah. See, it's a very difficult question to answer. See, what is needed is reskilling. Okay. All those who are employers, you know, when the software thing started in the U.S. in the early days. Where was software knowledge? And many of them were high school dropouts, but they became top class software programmers. So the employers must decide what is the skill that you need for doing this particular kind of particular kind of jobs. So and then accordingly you train them. Many of the car mechanics know everything about the car, but if you ask them, he says, I am a high school. But he can fix any car. So, jobs-wise, it's a question of skill. There is a certain amount of knowledge that is needed, minimum knowledge. Then, you need a skill to be able to apply that knowledge. And the employer must understand that. If he understands that, then of course, if you ask for a PhD and then gives him a job, a, a high school dropout can do, what's the big point? But it's good for him to show on, in my payroll there are so many PhDs. True. <laughs> I know, people must, yeah, skill, of course you need skills. They can be skilled after the hiring also, or you are already skilled. Because in some areas there may not be enough jobs. The best situation I have always said is the need for 100 people, it's part of queuing theory by the way in statistics. If 100 people are needed, you train only 99. Then everybody is in demand. But you train 101, at the end of one year there is one unemployed. Ten years, ten years. And then, this is the infinite queue problem in statistics. So, I would say, always train people a few percent less than what is the market demand. In fact, I have given a project for that, for doing this. Then everybody is in demand. They will get good salaries. Don't over train for that. The education institutions, and it is a tricky problem. It's not the demand today, but project the demand four years from now when our young people will graduate. It's a little stochastic field project, but it can be done. 
don't over train. Any educational institution but now are over train people and let them adrift. And everybody's salary comes down. Queuing thing, simplest problem in queuing. Yeah, I request you to keep your question simple and short, please. Hi, sir. So, I'd like to get your point on the uh, nuclear fusion reactors. Basically, there are two types, major types, magnetic confined and inertial com confined. So, which one do you think we will use in the near future and uh, which will be well diversely used? See, magnetic confinement is the one on which more work is being done. Inertial confinement like in Lawrence Livermore and all that essentially follows a nuclear, thermonuclear weapon. You create X-ray surrounding which squeezes, compresses the DT fuel. It's uh, something a little more uh, difficult to handle in the initial stage. So inertial confinement fusion will come one day. I've seen it have done in uh, drop by drop you give hydrogen and it fuses and then you pulse, pulse kind of uh, fusion power. But magnetic confinement will probably come fast when it becomes economically viable. Demonstration 300 megawatt like heater, that will come much earlier. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are, we'll take two more questions from the faculty members, please. Hello, sir. Sir, he's here. So you can take the phone. Hello. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, uh, well, thank you for this wonderful lecture. My question is, sir, like, uh, why India spends less percentage of GDP to research and development compared to other <laughs> smaller countries like South Korea or Israel? They spend huge uh, amount of percentage, you know, like. So I think this, if we can increase, then uh, development will be much faster, right? Thank you, sir. Mera dil also mange more. See, it is, you are right, stuck at about 1%. It should, actually, I have been trying to increase it. But, you know, they cut budgets everywhere. Every department budget is cut. So, the problem also is, you know, the other countries that you mentioned, the amount, percentage of R&D budget that comes from industry is much higher than in India. And they can turn it around and say, your researchers must work for industry, attract them, and make them pay for the results that they are getting. So, both have to be done. We have to increase academia-industry interaction and go on pressurizing the government to give more money. <laughs> I was in the government. I tried. But you know, if you are not careful, they would have cut your budget. That at least is. See, what has happened? The money is so much. They are now only covering the manpower. The manpower costs. They should go beyond that. And then you have to get... Basic research government has to support. But anything which is applied or potentially applied, we must induce the industry to collaborate and pay for it. So eventually, if you say it's industry oriented, some industry must already do. But you are right, we must keep on fighting, like we are also fighting. All of us are fighting for more money. Uh, I request the students to maintain silence, please. Good afternoon, Professor. Uh, thanks for your the eminent and the enlightening lecture uh, for uh, more than two hours now. Oh, two uh, hours? <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting one. Uh, Professor, uh, we would like to hear from your end uh, the smiling Buddha and the Operation Sakti. <laughs> so, what was your uh, uh, experience and the lessons learned? And uh, so, how the uh, Indian, uh, the national security has uh, strengthened by the way of this, the process. <laughs> Can you share your experiences? See, what had happened is originally, originally, the policy of the government was to keep the nuclear option open. 
keep the nuclear option open. But uh, Raja Ramanna, who was in charge of the physics at that time, when I was a much younger man, 1969, there was a big move on peaceful nuclear explosions. It was started by Eisenhower, swords into plowshares, and the International Atomic Energy Agency picked it up. And they were holding a number of meetings from 69 onwards on peaceful nuclear explosions for cutting canals, for breaking rocks underground so that uh, hydrocarbon reservoirs. One of the major applications they thought at that time was stimulation of hydrocarbon reservoirs, gas in particular. And it worked. See crevices and all, it's all broken across, more gas coming to come up. So we also said, Ramana asked me to go for these meetings in International Atomic Energy Agency. We said we want to also agree with you and we gave an application of copper mining, breaking the rocks, sending dilute sulfuric acid inside, recovering the ore and all that. But after we did the peaceful nuclear explosion in 1974, the Americans said there is nothing like a peaceful nuclear explosion. They were bluffing until that time. Because the physics of the nuclear explosive is the same, whether it's a nuclear weapon or a peaceful nuclear explosive. Only the packaging is different. And then the IAEA abandoned all these meetings. But then at that time, we only said this is a peaceful nuclear explosive. But then we continued. We kept the nuclear option open, went on working. We are, government asked us to continue with the working on the design. They didn't stop the work. But finally you have to test. But only when Prime Minister Vajupai came to power, we were given the authorization of uh, to work. So I told, I had told the Prime Minister, which is only opportunity for us. After that, everybody is going to give us problems after that. So we decided to test five weapons, five, so that all physics principles of designing weapons, including thermonuclear weapons, small yield weapons, which can be used as tactical weapons, can all be. So we tested off all the five designs, three on the first day, two days later, remaining others. That is how it was done. And now we have all the knowledge that we need for uh, designing any kind of weapon that we want. <laughs> thank, you, uh, thank you very much for all the, to all the participants. Uh, I thank uh, our esteemed uh, guest of honor for his enthralling speech, emphasizing on directed basic research, the role of academic institutions, teachers and students in nation building, and to make India a leading knowledge economy in the world in the, in the future. So we now come to the end of the lecture. I request our uh, Pro Vice Chancellor from Chennai campus, Dr. Kanchana Bhaskaran, to present a memento to Padma Vibhushan, Dr. R. Chidambra. Now I would like to call upon Dr. R. Ramanujam, Assistant Director, Directorate of Quality Assurance and Accreditation to propose the word of thanks. Good afternoon everyone. It is my honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of VIT organizing team. At the outset, I extend my gratitude to our AACT Distinguished Chair Professor of VIT, Batma Vibhushan, Dr. R. Chidambaram, former Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India and former Chairman Atomic Energy Commission for visiting us and delivering the AACT Distinguished Chair Professor Lecture 
on emerging technologies and technologies for foresight. Thank you, sir, for inspiring us, inspiring speech and words of wisdom. I thank AACT for providing the opportunity to host this AACT Distinguished Chair Professor Lecture at VAT Vellur. A special thanks to Dr. Amit Kumar Srivastava, Director, AACT Faculty Development Cell and IT Wing of AACT for extending their support and broadcasting this lecture live in AACT YouTube channel. VAT looks forward to host such type of lectures in the days to come. We are thankful to our Honorable Chancellor, Vice Presidents, Vice Chancellor, Pro-Vice Chancellors, Registrar, Deans and Directors for their guidance and support. Our heartfelt thanks to the faculty members, staff, research scholars, students of VIT and external participants for their active participation. And also I thank all other participants who have joined online too. Last but not the least, I thank the CTS team, Office of Event Management, Outreach, PRO, Estates, Transport and Security to make this event a grand success. Thank you all. Thank you very much. So we come to the end of the session. Uh, I request all of you please be seated yeah. one minute. Uh, I the request you to leave the auditorium, please.